Okay. Thanks to our super efficient team, we can get the show on the road actually on time. That's wonderful. That's what's happening this year, this cycle. Uh, last week I was knocked out with the coronal and protogen that's over, and now we will proceed. So everything's moved back when we can understand. If you look at the news where everyone went, which is what you should always do, or else you go to my show website, you'll get the latest iteration of it. Now, all it means is everything moved back a week. That's all. Uh, as they say, due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> In abundance of caution. Do, that's right, abundance of caution. I want to start, as we always do, by thanking Shomri and Muna for being the sponsor. I mean, the venue. I want to thank the layman's out there here um, for being the series sponsor. Tonight, I want to thank the Glazers, as you can see. Sponsor, and this is Abby Glazer and your daughter. This is in Florida. He's smart. <laughs> that's where we should all be. <laughs> yeah, we, we should be where Abby is. Um, it's very nice. in honor of Dr. Mills and Sandra Glazer. Uh, as I said before, everything's moved back a week. And I want to thank us, as we always do, the tech team for making everything really running so smooth. I'm afraid to open my mouth. I say, I'll tell the tell song. And therefore, without any further ado, we'll get the show on the road. As you know, this year, the name of the series is The Last Years Before Oslo. The State of Israel and the Jewish People in 1988 to 1992. Tonight's the ninth lecture. As we know, the uh, now, this is actually going to core issues involving Israel that we're all aware of. As you know, the Palestinians have been Israel's unsolvable problem, and vice versa. This is a fact. Okay? And it boils down to a two-state solution, or not. Yeah? That's where you get into. Now, the Palestinians, as I tried to describe, didn't exist basically until 1964. In other words, with a kind of group identity, national identity, um, which was 16 years into the state of Israel. But to be perfectly honest, that just means the good Lord gave Israel a breathing space of 16 years. It wasn't due to any smart move in part of Israel, and due to the fact that after 48 war, they were like discombobulated, and there were refugee camps all over the place, and they actually put their trust in Nasser and these other Arab countries to bail them out. That was good from the Ben-Gurion point of view. You get what I'm saying? Because no, they're not doing it, they're waiting for the states. Israel preferred a state-to-state -state kind of confrontation. Um, they were unknown, actually, except the specialists. If you ask the average American in the 1950s, early 60s, or the Palestinians, they didn't win, they didn't win actually know them. They might say the Jews. You understand? Matter of fact, I remember the first time they hijacked a plane, or the second or third time, when it, maybe it was the big one in 1970, you know, when they landed in the uh, Jordan and the airport and all that. I think it was that one. And, you know, they had some American, they kept the Jews on board, but they had some American regular people on board, which would be like, oh, and they said, what is it all about? It's the Palestinians. They said, what is that? You understand? No, they themselves didn't understand. However, to give them credit, those kind of hijacks, you put them on the front page, and it did make the people up. By the time that was all over, everybody knew who they were. Can't deny it. Okay? So, until 64, they were called refugees. If you're old enough to remember that, um, you know, then we will do so. Remember the old 1964 New York World's Fair? We had that display for refugees. You see what I'm saying? Now, Here's the interesting thing, in my opinion, which is all you ever get. In my opinion, if they would have decided in 64 afterwards to go to Martin Luther King group, I think they would have escaped by now. That's, that's my opinion. If they would say, you know, if, and that's smart. You and I, we're living in the West. If they would go that route and say, we completely renounce violence and all this kind of stuff, but we want what's coming to us and all that kind of business, it's going to be hard pressed on that, you know? It, 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 that would require a great deal of wisdom. Um, they're worse, and, and mind you, not that they're actually nonviolent or the rest, as a tactic. You get it? I don't even know if Martin Luther King was actually nonviolent, but it was a very smart tactic. You get it? A very smart tactic. And uh, go to the next guy, uh, Dr. Mubarak Awad. He is exactly that. He's this big Palestinian guy who's been a very big activist and all that. He's been pushing the nonviolent thing for years as a tactic. Because he says what I just told you, which is we do better if we went this way. Okay? Now, this is fascinating because it actually copied the Jewish response of, of the Yeshua back in the late 1930s when the Arabs had the intifada of the 1930s, from let's say 35, 36 to 39, there was a big outbreak of violence, all the rest of it. So, I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge internal debate in the Zionist movement itself between A and B, and the main line was Havla guys, they call it, which is turned the other cheek. And they did that because you get more political credit that way. You see? 
more PR, and from a political struggle point of view, that's what it's all about. Versus the other side, which says, you hit us, we hit you twice. That was Jabotinsky. That was the Mahogis in these shows back in the 1930s. The majority, right? The majority, well, I'll call Ben Gordon for lack of a better word, Chaim Weiss, all those guys, they said, no, you go to the Garu, and that is what they did. And they didn't get hurt by that attitude. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the Jewish national cause. They didn't get hurt by that attitude. Um, now, Palestinians, whatever, chose a different route to arms struggle. Okay? No, it's from day one, from 1964 on, this is not going to be the one. It's the king route, it's going to be another route. Arms struggle, and not only that, they're not going to be um, restricted to military targets to go over terrorism. And that's Arafat's a poster boy action. Okay, so no, we can blow up a, a school bus, anything's fair game. So that's 180 degrees the extreme from the Martin Luther King. In between would be a policy still like this. We're only fighting the Menachem, I'll call it Menachem Baby, which is we're fighting military targets, we're not out to hurt civilians, we're here for you know, to, make, to make a political point, but that's not what the way they went. They went as they you know, all Jews are going game, fair game. Okay? Now, in addition to armed struggle, uh, the Palestinians, of course, had the PLO Charter, under which all the Jews had to leave, unless you were there before 1917. So in other words, let's put it this way. It was more of a emotional type thing than a uh, true political tactic type thing. Because, as I'll try to make the point in a moment, you know, what is your goal? So back at that time, they were very emotional. So they said, the goal is to wipe out Israel. And remember, this is before the 67 war. So, and... I think a lot of the Arabs really thought in terms of the next war, they didn't figure the 67 war would go the way it did. They thought it would go the other way, as many of us did immediately prior to the 67 war. We remember that. And so in that context, I might as well put all my cards on the table and the heck with political correctness and all the rest of it. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. And then these things became something of a, of a drag from the point of view of cynical tactical politics. That's, all my, that's my point. We're not dealing with Siddiquim over here, but that's not the point. Siddiq so shows you from the beginning their goal was to eliminate Israel. That's what they really wanted. But they didn't have a plan how to do it. Now, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War demonstrated that Israel was not going to be militarily defeated. So maybe back in 64, 65, those years, they thought that you know you can actually take Israel down through some kind of military way, or even through a, a, a I'll call it a terrorism route. Um, they had just done this in Algeria. Okay? So you have to understand that the establishment of PLO in 64 is coming right on the heels of the triumph in Algeria, which was a big triumph. Okay? Um, which, by the way, was a war in which the French once won militarily, but, they, but the, the Algerians won anyway. Which is my point. Which is my point. Now, um, the Six Day War and Yom Kippur War sure showed Israel was going to be militarily defeated. And the Palestinians didn't have the military power to do it. And in addition, it became clear after a decade or so or more that Israel was not Algeria, which the PLO thought it might be. The Jews were not exactly colonialists the way the French were. The French could run away, even though I'm oversimplifying it, and that's what they did. Um, I remember when I was very young, you see all these tongues, the, the Algeria route, the, the, the struggle with the masses and all the rest of it. And many times I've heard Israeli jihad, as it sticks in my mind, it was like some rally about the fellow a zillion years ago. And I think it was General Barlev or something like that. And he said, you know, you try to explain why it's not Algeria. Okay? Um, Jews not, are not, despite the Arab rhetoric, Jews not colonialists. Well, let's put it this way, they don't see themselves that way. And so at the end of the day, the Palestinian national is kind of very racist, you get it? Which is, you view Jews in a very cynical uh, kind of way. Um, thanks to their vicious violence against civilians, as well as their vicious past, as well as their misunderstanding of Judaism, <coughs> it became clear over time that they're not going to win over this fight yet. Uh, there was a thought in the 60s and 70s that you can somehow rather persuade this fighter that you're really Arabs together with us. You see? Uh, and I think he's supposed to be speaking the opposite, you know. <laughs> Quite the reverse. Meaning, they didn't understand really, well, let's put it this way, they tried to impose through the ideological rhetoric, you know, a reality, but the reality did not fit, as you and I are well aware, which is just interesting. So then, what is the plan? 
Let's say you're only not in 1964, but in 74, or not in 1967, but in 1977 or 78 or 80, to, and you're Palestinian. You know, what exactly is the plan? Okay? Um, they could only win if there's a kind of political solution. So they were dreaming they have some kind of Kissinger thing, in which America pulled out of North Vietnam. You get it? No, that's a political solution where you agree to lose. Yep, that's what that's what Kissinger did. I mean, it was tricked up with phrases and so forth. But the bottom line is, when you and I look at that picture, we know what's going on. So that's why they, we want some variant of that kind of business, right? Uh, now, mind you, just in the case of Kissinger and Lee Ducto, the political solution would be a stronger tactic. Because what exactly happened? Kissinger and the North Vietnamese signed a a treaty of some kind or other, which was Islamic business. Now, as America got out of that, eventually, it didn't take them too long to take over the whole business. And so, in the mind of Arafat and all the other intellectuals, and plenty of Palestinians went to college, right? Uh, plenty. So, uh, there'll be some kind of situation where there'll be heavy pressure put in Israel, and first they'll agree to this, and then they'll agree to that, and then they'll agree to that, and there'll be nothing left. Now, this, is, this is more or less the political thinking that was going on over there, okay? Now, to obtain a political solution, the PLO embarked on an impressive international campaign that all the countries in the world, all the countries in the world, to support some kind of state for the Palestinians. You remember, and I remember, every two minutes, Arafat was in another country, in another country, and not just Russia or China. I'm talking England, France, Germany, Guatemala, I mean, you name it, okay? Singapore, that's what he did, okay? So you got to hand it to him that on the political uh, activity front, in terms of diplomacy, they're very successful. All the countries except for one. US. All the countries except for one. USA. To the other countries, Arafat could shoot the bullet and say, I know we have a charter, appeal a charter, etc. But don't worry, when the time comes, it'll work out. That was a bunch of bull. But, you know, the French were fine with that. The British were fine with that. The Germans, the Italians, and who knows what were fine with that. Because they don't really care. You see? <laughs> they don't care. Only the Americans... Thanks to Kissinger's pledge, that was given, you know, after the first disengagement, you know, or the second disengagement after the Yom Kippur War, only the Americans said to the Palestinians repeatedly, and this is to their credit, as long as you have these official goals, we will not deliver Israel, and we will not negotiate with you. We won't get into the game of negotiating with Arafat to get him to say I recognize Israel. Now, the Arafat said, my only card, that's his language, is, you know, the legitimacy of Israel. So don't make me do this at the beginning of negotiations. Now, for all the ups and downs of President Ford and President Carter and President Reagan, they certainly had ups and downs. Uh, for all that stuff, the Americans never did do that. They said, listen, you don't get to negotiate whether you recognize Israel. You follow? That's, that's at the beginning. And then we'll see what the, what the details are. And in fact, twist in, 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 up and down, in and out. You could, you know, give a whole lecture on the twists and turns, and every senator you met and you made hints and all that kind of stuff. But the United States government did not change. That's, you know, which is just interesting, okay? Which is just interesting. From about 1970 to 1988, that's how things went. Which stymied the PLO. So all these presidents, you know, you have to even get credit to that regard. So they stymied the political process. No, there's nothing happened in terms of negotiating anything about the future of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and all that stuff. And certainly, in terms of negotiations between the State of Israel on the one hand and Palestinian representatives on the other, it didn't happen. Now, from the Likud point of view, good, it's not being this good. Okay, that's the Likud one. From a reality point of view, however, time does not stand still. I mean, the Palestinians are in the millions in the Shachim, and they're not going to be docile all this time. Is that how it goes? So, you know, I understand that people feel this way, feel that way, but, you know, there's also the reality. And Israel, from its point of view, knew perhaps how to battle the PLFO in, in a military struggle. I mean, here's the Bagans invasion of Lebanon. So, for what it's worth, as we said, they got this far, and then Arafat and the PLO had to leave and go to Tunisia. Okay? Now, not all of them, not really, but, you know, the main thing. So, if you give the army a goal, take over Beirut or something, kick this guy out. It's only, you know, that they kind of knew how to do from a military operational kind of view, kind of, kind of, okay? 
But Israel did not know how to defeat Palestinian nationalism. Okay? Including among the population of the Shtachim. And this is a problem that won't go away. I mean, how are you going to do it? Unless you're Rabbi Kahana, say, Kekam Olai, I can't do that. Right? So what is, what is, and that was Kahana's whole son, where he says, I got the only one that's a little bit, you know? So if not, so, so, so what do you do? You can't simply say slogans and this and that. And the, what do you do? Okay? Now, as we all know, the IDF did not know how to deal with the Intifada, which is what broke out all over the Israeli occupied terror, all over the Shahim, in the end of December of 1987, when Shamir was the prime minister and Rafin was the defense minister. So, in other words, you had a joint government, I'll say it again, Shamir was the prime minister and the head of the Labour Party was the defense minister. And the head of the Labour Party was not exactly what we call it an inexperienced guy, it's like a bin, okay? So, in other words, in terms of knowing the military stuff, they would do, and yet they didn't know how to fight the Intifada. You see? The Intifada was caused by an Israeli blunder. I don't know if anybody remembers this from yesterday. Israel's made plenty share of plenty of big blunders. And this was the Jibril deal of 1955. I doubt if anybody remembers that. The Arabs held three Israeli POWs from the Lebanon War. Three. The Israeli public, understandably, bled over the fate of these three captives. That's what happens. The Jews are like that. They go crazy, the three guys. And I understand that from a human point of view, right? Especially very Jewish. But it invites the Arabs to take advantage of these tender feelings, which is what they did. And so in 1985, when there was a joint government, so both sides were equally guilty, it's the Labour Party and the Likud Party, okay? Uh, the Ahmed Jibril group, if you remember this, that they used to operate out of Syria. It's the popular front for somewhere else. They demanded, and they got the following exchange. We will give you three Israeli POWs. You will give us 1,150 hardened killers. Yes. 1,150, 1,150. And I'm talking about people which are in it, you know? Including, by the way, the sheik who started Hamas, who would go to start Hamas. So they took the worst guys out of jail, the worst guys, um, and understand this very well. They released them into the Shachim, because that was the deal, in order to get three guys back. Okay? And everybody today, with hindsight, says this was the cause of all the trouble. Right? This is a terrible mistake, and it's acknowledged today. As they said, you know, it's a, the guilt is on both sides. Now, I understand that you understand why they did it. Three guys of, remember, the Gil and Shalit, you know, Israel has this shtick. You understand? We are that type of people. Perhaps all Americans are like that also to some degree or another. You know, the, the, in a communist country, they don't talk about who their missing guys are. But in a democracy, the press complain all the time, and I understand it. But although they saved three lives, many, many more Israelis would die from the Intifada. These hardened 1150 guys would cause so Israel allowed its head to be led by its heart, which was a mistake. And that's the reason, and since then, I mean, you know, Israel has by far a perfect record. But I know in the Bibi and all the rest of it, you know, they still got two or three people somewhere, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to play that game. Right? He was trying not to, anyway. Uh, you know, the Germans are intervening, all the rest of it. Because this is classic Hamas policy till today. They say it. They like to kidnap people and get their guys out of jail. And once again, we'll be released in there and cause all of the trouble again. Okay? If you remember, and I know you do, in the last couple of wars in Gaza, of there was one now under Biden, there was one or two before Trump. You know, remember they were looking to catch an Israeli soldier. Remember that? You know, in the tunnels. They just they, they, they catch one guy, they kind of won. All right. So um, the result is when the Intifada broke out, which was generated by these guys. Now I don't blame them, they are that's who they are. It's Israel's fault, but it's the same like this. You put a cancer back in the body, and they wonder if you get sick. You said from a security uh, point of view. Uh, so the result was, it broke out of warfare in a, at the end of 87, so it's really 88, 89, 90, and so forth. Um, that was A, asymmetrical, and B, political. So this is the kind of warfare Israel's not good at. Get it? Now, lately they're better, but I'm talking about especially those that, you know, it wasn't in their, in their uh, skill set and tactical memory. Israel was always thinking the 48 war, the 56, 67, 73, even 82, that's a war. <laughs> and, you know, conventional. And it's a different thing altogether. Okay? 
That, by the way, doesn't mean it's not as effective in some ways. It can be more effective. It's the Algeria route, you understand? In which you can beat me militarily, but I'll still win. You can beat me militarily, but I'll still win. It's a different kind of thinking. Um, so it's the asymmetrical route. By that I mean Israel had all the weapons and tanks, all the rest of these guys did. And number two, it's political. Okay? Political struggle is different than a military struggle. Now, to be perfectly honest, if you want to analyze it philosophically, Clausewitz said famously that war is the pursuit of politics by other means. And he's right. In other words, if you have a war, you better have a goal. And it better be a realizable goal so that this war makes sense. If you have no goal, which happens, well, we in this country have had our share. You have a world with no goal, then you're just wasting the lives of these guys. Okay? And alternatively, if you have a goal that's impossible of realization, you're wasting the lives of these guys. Understand? But so, so in other words, there's a philosophy behind war. That's why Bush defined, I'm talking about Bush the first, defined the war as, you know, we kick him out of uh, Kuwait. So it's a very, you know, narrow goal. He said, why don't you go farther? He said, when you get too far, comes it probably gets messy like I tried to say last time. Um, that's number one. And number two is political, a political struggle, not in a Clausewitz sense, has, a, has assumed the role in the 20th century of if I win psychologically, you know, if I win psychologically, if I get the hearts and minds of the enemy or the world who could persuade the enemy, so I, I, I get my goal not through classic military means of defeating physically the other army, but through other ways, okay? Which, as I said before, for example, will happen in Algeria and many other places. So Israel just wasn't thinking this way. Now, there are smart people. There are smart people, but everybody thinks it within their cultural context. So Israel was thinking about, you know, the conventional business, and all over the Stachim, they started rioting and throwing this, and rocks, and not even beginning to throw rocks. Okay? Now, to tell you the truth, um, the Palestinians were successful. Uh, the Palestinian leaders who planned this uprising, which was these 1150 plus other cover like that in the Shabbat wasn't there, in fact, they used Chachma. After all, what's the point of rioting if there's no plan? The plan, stripped to its essentials, was to win the Israeli left to the cause of a two state solution. Okay? Uh, if they make life bad enough for the soldiers and other stuff in the Shtachim, they make it seem like it's a Vietnam, a quagmire. In the Shtachim, then the Israeli left will uh, implement a two-state solution. They'll say, we can't stay, we've got to pull our guys out. That's exactly what happened. They said, no, they, they, they won. That's exactly what happened. They didn't win exactly 100% of the way they thought, but that, that, that's what it was. So the Intifada, it's a classic example of a war fought by other means. Okay? Now, um, in order not to alienate the Israeli left, the leaders in Tefada refrained from doing anything inside Israel proper. And so in 88, 89, all the rest of it, the Shtachim didn't spread to the Israeli Arabs. They didn't go and do uh, terrorist things inside Israel proper. That came after Oslo. <laughs> See? Came after Oslo. Here they confine themselves over here, not because they're like, they can, you know, I don't, I don't have to tell you that, but they say we want to make the guys in Tel Aviv in order to feel comfortable. It's not, you know, that's the Vietnam syndrome. The average American sitting at home is like, it's not a lot of them, hell with that, it doesn't affect me. You see, that way of thinking. Okay? So it's very smart. Um, in order for the riots not to be violent, they didn't use ammo and, and weapons, which they could have done. They'd give everybody an AK 47 and all this kind of stuff. It would be demonstrations, Hafgano, which were not about harming Israeli personnel, but about defying their orders, not listening. And that, and if you can get them on CNN, so to speak, then, then you, you hit a home run, okay? That way, if the Israeli army used Israeli force, it would use force, it would be disproportionate. <coughs> oh boy, that's a new word, yeah, disproportionate. It would be tyrannical. And it would be a propaganda game that hurts Israel. It was a smart strategy, a kind of active, nonviolent civil disobedience in front of CNN. Because, as we all know <laughs> from Bishop Barclay, if CNN isn't there, <laughs> right, if, the tree, if nobody heard it, the tree didn't fall. You know, if, if, if the uh, 
CNN, now I'm, I'm dating myself. You know, now anybody with a, with a cell phone can do it. The internet, you know, if, if, it, if it didn't if get recorded, it didn't happen, you see? And so they were smart enough, and so it didn't stop them. You know, you wonder, but it's always easy for everybody to say afterwards, you know, Chaz <coughs> Almighty says stupid. If they would have, now, if the Palestinians would have stuck to the scrupulously nonviolent uh, scenario, never doing anything physical against the Israeli soldiers, but not obeying them. I mean, in other words, boycotting Israeli products, not paying the taxes, building without permits, things like that. I think it would have been devastating for Israel. But the Martin Luther King thing went and get too much against the Arab culture. Certainly against the culture of the Shachim. And it didn't take long before they were throwing dangerous stones and who knows what. You know what I'm saying? Really, if they would have been very smart, from a political point of view, don't ever pick up even a stone. Let the Israeli shoot at you. Let them see, see you hit somebody over your head. Isn't this exactly what the civil rights movement did in America? Mm-hmm. You get the picture in Alabama of the police fighting the, 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 the demonstrators and all this kind of stuff, right? You know, the, the, that's, that's what wins. But it went too much against the culture. And before long, they didn't use guns, but you, you know, stones are pretty dangerous. But on the other hand, if you're the international media, um, and by the way, it is part of the Palestinian culture, I mean, going long back, way back when. I don't want to be too egg heady here, but they had stones rolling as a protest thing back in the 1830s when Palestine was invaded by Ibrahim Pasha, the son of the Khedive, Muhammad Ali, and it took over 10 years. And, you know, there's, there's a long history of stuff. But if you're in the media, especially, you know, NBC and the, the French and the British, let's get it now. They got the stones, they got the guns. Which one's David and which one's Goliath? Get it? This is very clever. Now, by the way, sometimes you end up using Molotov cocktails. Whoa, that's, that's not much different. Okay, Molotov, that's, that's really different. In any event, the disproportion was there, and the Palestinians leveraged it. If Israel kills the teen rioters, the PLO wins. Now, they took a, they took a leaf from, from the Israeli history. We did that with very devastating political effect with the Exodus ship which was totally a PR business. The Exodus was totally a PR business, and it got all the way here. Look, this is back from 47. The largest shipload of Zionist refugees, the vessel having been rammed and damaged by a British destroyer in a wild melee when British sailors fought their way aboard. The Exodus 1947, an old American Chesapeake Bay steamer which took aboard 4,500 Zionists bound for Palestine. Taken to the port of Haifa, the refugees will be put aboard another vessel and sent back to France whence they came. 35 were injured, several killed, including the first mate of the American Jewish crew. This is a climax in the story of immigrant ships intercepted by the British while bringing Zionist refugees to Palestine. Now, that guy was in front of them, Zionists instead of Jews, but it was right after the Second World War. And, you know, the UNSCOP, the, the United Nations Commission that was investigating whether or not to make a partition into a Jewish Arab state, was at the dock hmm. when the Exodus came in and all these people came with beaten up and moved all the rest of it. And that's what convinced some of the members of UNSCOP to vote for Israel, let's put it that way. So I'm just trying to tell you, yeah, the British stopped the ship, but they lost the war, they lost the war you see. So the Arabs know this. Like I said before, if I was a Palestinian and I went to college and I got a degree, let's say, from Berkeley and I was in media studies from poli side and I'm devoted to my cause, it don't take too much imagination to say, let's copy from their book. It, it's just smart. You see? I'll say it again, Israel didn't cop. They, you know, they, were, they were left-handed, shall we say. And I'm sorry to say. And so, again... If Israel kills the teenage rioters, the PLO wins. If Israel blows up the house of a terrorist and the media is there, the PLO wins. Etc. Etc. Okay? Uh, now, Menachem Begin, by the way, in the 1940s, grasped this. Begin, when he started the revolt in 44, he said, it's not a regular revolt. We're revolting in a glass house. Because whatever the British does, does the, the media is going to be there. You understand? Whatever the British doesn't mean is going to be there. Uh, if the British wanted to, they could have crushed the Ukrainian thing else by doing to the Jews in the 40s what they did to the Arabs in the 30s. 
and the Arab Intifada got out of hand. They sent 50,000 soldiers, and they burned down towns and crushed people and this and that and the other, whatever it took. You understand? I mean, they were very tough and vicious, and they busted them. But Begin said, yes, but it's the 1940s, and uh, we're in a glass house. Well, I got news for you. Israel today, I mean, for a long time, has been in a glass house. I can't deny it. Okay? Rabin and company didn't grasp this. Because if Rabin said like this, if they go right, break their bones, break their bones. Break their bones. Well, that's really smart. Okay? I'm an American, or somebody else watching the show. These are kids that are demonstrating the street. And the head of Israel is to break their bones. Right? Which, by the way, is an Israeli idiom. But it's not worth idiom at all. You know, you need media advisor, get it? You know, that's not the words to use. So that was like a gift uh, to the Arabs, which it was. Okay? And worst of all, Worst of all, the Israeli GIs were unprepared, and therefore their morale plummeted. Then as a result, that's, that's the, the fault of the upper ups, or the high officers, okay? Because you send guys that are training, in an asymmetrical situation, it's a riot thing, you could get killed, or something like that. There's no training, you come out of it traumatized. It took a while for Israel to get used to this and train the soldiers for intifadas. You can train soldiers for anything. And Israel's good there. All right? This around the world. There's such a thing called training for this scenario and training for that scenario. There are. There are ways of doing it. That's what armies are about. The plus of an army is they have training programs when they want to and can prepare you for, you know, in a professional way for almost anything. But that's not what the soldiers did. Now, the Israeli uh, anti, uh, you know, the Faduda guys, whatever they call them, you know, who run around like these, you know, they, they did plenty of assassinations of uh, bad guys. And the Shtachim, you know, like the TV shows, and they killed the, lo the, the local ring leaders here and there. But they themselves say, because all we're doing is mowing the lawns. Right? Because they're not the lawn folks. You see? And so, now, from a certain point of view, it's very interesting psychologically. From an economic point of view, the Palestinians hurt themselves. I think everyone here, or maybe not everyone, but most of you are not so young, remember nobody went to the show anymore. Remember that? There was a time, I think we all remember this. There was a time when you went to Israel, one of the things you did, you went through at the show, you bought this and that and the other or whatever, and, 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 and so forth. And then there came a time it was empty. See, it's empty. And they got hit in the pot, well, they don't care. You see? From a psychological point of view, the Intifada, which is mostly young people and teenagers, it was a very satisfying release of anger. Okay? And you simply have to understand that. They had a pent up emotion. And they're all well. And you know, hate the occupation. And they hate the Israel. And they wish they all go away. And here's a chance to boom. It was also very empowering, which is a heady experience. I'll give you an example of one poem. It's very simple. Let's say you're a bunch of Israeli soldiers, conscripts. Right? Guys who are doing their regular service, 18, 19, 20 years old. And let's say you're patrolling an Arab village in 1990. And there's a bunch of Arab teens watching from a, a distance, of a block or two. <coughs> the initiative is in the hands of whom? You see? The initiative is in the hands of whom? The tension is building up, and the teens can, because of the nature of the situation I'm describing, either cause trouble or not. So I'm the leader of, of a gang. I feel like a million bucks. Right? I could freak these soldiers out. I could, the resource of market, the resource of my concept. You understand? The soldiers, again, are untrained for this. They're, what they got, six months of training? They got the young guys. Because they didn't send them special units, they sent regular soldiers, the conscripts. They're freaked out, they're psychologically damaged. The teens are supercharged. Because if they want to, they can throw one stone and then leave. Or they can throw a hundred stones and leave. Or they can make an ambush here, or not. So who is dominating who? This is the essence of what you call asymmetrical warfare. You guys have a bunch of guns and uniforms, all the rest of it, but I'm in charge. Now, it's necessary for the training to take all this into account. But they did. Okay? Now, this soldier, this is really young guy who's, let's say, 19 years old. And Kyle Homer, he's a reservist who's older and is already married. And just had to do his, you know, was it a month or two or something like that? And they send him out to Hebron, I don't know where. And then when he returns home, let's say he returns home after whatever time, 
he regards the shtachim as a Vietnam. Now, as every guy that comes home is coming with a negative. He doesn't want to return there. He shares his feeling with others at home, and the national morale is affected. Slowly but surely, the attitude forms in the Israeli left and in the Israeli center. Okay? Then we've got to get out of there. Not for their sake, for the sake of our own soldiers. It's an impossible situation. You get it? So notice there's a classic example I'm talking about. Only the Israeli right resists this. So again, it's left, middle, and right. So the left is going to be that way anyway, but the center now was devoted to this way of thinking because, like I said before, your son, your daughter, your, your nephew, this, that, and the other, especially if they come back hurt. But even if they don't come back hurt. It's like, remember the old Vietnam movies we used to see you know, when the guys came back, I forget what they call them, you know, they're tra traumatized and things like that. PTSD. Whatever. Only the right resistance for the moment. In the years I'm talking about, from 1988 to 1992, Rabin and Aaron, who took over after him, if you remember that Targil Amasriach, we talked about all the dirty politics in Israel. So the two defense ministers were Yitzhak Rabin and Moshe Aaron. Yitzhak Rabin, of course, had been a soldier. Aaron had not been a soldier, but he was a tough guy. So they hung tight. But deep down, Rabin was cracking. We know this today. Deep down, he was cracking, which is understandable. And at the end of the day, okay, um, you have this lousy situation, but an explosion of anger on the part of Palestinians is, is useless if it's not tied to some specific political goal <clears throat> and some political strategy. Even riots, seems like it. You know, is it going somewhere, not going somewhere? This is just how life operates in general. You have a plan, you're doing something towards a plan, or you're just drifting. How many people, you know, they just drift through life? You know, they, they, they have no plan, right? Like, you, no, no, no goal, nothing they would define as being successful. Now, everybody has the right to his and herself to define success. They really want. It's a free country, but it's really sad if you don't have any goal or something like that. So, which way is it going, Okay. The Intifada was rather spontaneous. Uh, it wasn't planned by Arafat, he was in Tunisia. Rather, the local villages throughout the Shtachim, the, the Arab villages, connected with each other informally, which is why Israel was taken by surprise. Because Israel, the uh, Mossad and all those guys, you know, they listen 24-7 to all the official, you know, the PLO and the uh, PLFP and all that kind of stuff. But they weren't listening because they just weren't thinking about it. At the local level, when Abdul Amir calls his sister over there, you know, in another village and talking, whatever. Israel was convinced that this couldn't be local, must be directed by Arafat, and they said, of course, it's a sneaky, fiendish plot from far away. That's why Israel bombed Tunis, we talked about last year, and that's why they assassinated the guy they thought was coordinating it all, Abu Jihad. Uh, remember, he came in his house in the middle of the and shot him and all the rest of it. <laughs> they shot him and didn't shoot the family. <laughs> but I told you that story. Reggae said, it came in, and it was a secret operation. It came in the middle of the night in Tunisia. It's not what we did it on it. And actually, it was last year when I was doing it out of my house. And Israel shot the guy like 10,000 times. But they didn't take any credit for it. You know, they didn't acknowledge that they did it. But Ronald Reagan said, because it can't be Israel, why? They didn't shoot the women. <laughs> now, uh, but his death didn't make much of a difference, because he really wasn't real. I mean, you know, to some degree he was running, but really he's a local kind of business. In addition, he's really, those, I forget the code of Fadudah, Shmadudah, whatever that is. He says, they were increasingly efficient, but as they, so in other words, they really were taking out this person and taking out this person, taking out this person. You can get that book from Bergman, you know, you're all, you know, when they got this guy and when they got that guy. But like I said before, it's just putting out the fires. It's not putting out the fire. You're putting out fires, you're not putting out the fire. You're among the grace. Okay? It was the middle of all this junk, that King Hussein just pulled out. King Hussein said, uh, I renounce any connection between Jordan and the West Bank, so it's up to Palestinians. So there goes the Jordanian option, so to speak, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but Israel will discuss the Shtachim to the degree that the Likud will discuss anything about it with Jordan, not Arafat. And now King Jordan said, well, don't count me in. And then in the middle of all this came the Saddam Hussein war. As it, it was in 90, when the Intifada was still going on, okay? So everybody took a break for five minutes. If you remember, the Palestinians were watching with glee as the rockets did Tel Aviv and all that. But for five minutes, 
the, the Intifada took a break. Okay? Now, after the USA victory, Bush and Baker determined to use their prestige to end the Arab-Israeli conflict. By this time, the front-line Arab states, so that would be uh, Egypt and uh, Syria and uh, you know, uh, Jordan and so forth, front-line Arab states plus the states of the Arabian Peninsula, the Saudi Arabians and the Gulf of guys, were de facto ready to live with the reality of Israel. So there was a big change. Okay? And they said, you know, we're willing to recognize the law of Israel provided there's a Palestinian state. I mean, the Arabians said, we want this. The surprise was even Syria. Was the U.S. prestige at that time was so powerful after they won the war that even Syria, where Assad was constant, Assad the father, was constantly maneuvering to recover the Golan, plus access to the Canary, without really making peace with the state of Israel. So you understand? Know the goal of Syria, all, down until today, but all through this time, was to recover the Golan Heights. I want you to understand we're talking about this. Here is where the water starts and ends up here and then goes down the Jordan River. So, and by the way, this is a picture. No, but today Israel has this, right? This is the Golan. So I'll show you a picture before 67. This is the map that, that Assad wants. Okay? I want to go back to before 67. I want to be very, very clear about this. I want to go back to 467. Which will leave, as you see over here, the source of the water in Syria's hands. So if they want, they can pinch it off. It'll just be in the treaty, they won't pinch it off. Like if you can trust them. Okay? Moreover, I'm not finished. Look at this. If you can look closely, the Israeli border, let's say here you can tell. Here's the Sea of Galilee, and here's all part of Israel. Well, what I'm doing right now is all part of Israel. It's about 100, 200, 300 feet, I forget exactly. Do you, you understand? There's a crazy border. In other words, Syria, I'm talking about legally, Syria does not border on the Canaries. It's as far away as that wall, or approximately. But they don't border the Canary. Which to Syria is like, mm, mm. it's not fair. Now, the reason is, when they drew up the border lines in 1923, the British and the French did it that way. So in other words, it's got nothing to do with the Syrian people, one of the Palestinian people, all the rest of it, because that's how it's British and the French. And so if you're a Syrian, and notice I understand this, you say, you, you made a border, <laughs> you know, up, up to the well, but, but 100 feet before the well, so I can't get any water from the well. In this case, the Canary. Now, Israel is always like this. That's the border. That's the border. You don't like us, we don't like you. We want it all for us. Okay? After all, we need the water. You have other sources of water in Syria. This is the core of what the Israeli-Syria argument has always been. It's always been. And the Syrians always said, you know, uh, we want all this, and we also want this thing here. Okay? And I want to tell you something. Under Bill Clinton and later on, uh, Rabin and these other guys said to Syria, he says, okay, we'll let you have it provided you can have the sovereignty, but we get to use the word or something like that. No, it was, they're crazy. <coughs> but this is, no, it's funny, you know, you understand? Now, I repeat, today, after the 67 war, you may have the 70 war, Israel occupies all this. So Israel's holding all the water. Uh, uh, you know, so when you hear about the Golan Heights, it's not a typical situation. It's not a typical situation. Okay? Usually, you say like this. Many people don't understand the simple truth. Usually say that the acquisition of territory by war is inadmissible. I get that. That's in the UN. But if I gotta give you back land, which then gives you the opportunity of choking me off. Yeah. That's not right. Now, you can be a stigma, so it doesn't matter. Well, then I say, I don't care what it doesn't matter, because it's my life. It's because it matters. You understand? So it's a fine point of international law. You get it? It's a fine point of it. Now, if the U.S. and Canada, all right, it ain't the U.S. and Canada, you see? So then, so, then what do you do? So again, the Syrian state tells they say, well, you know, the international law, you can't take over any territory. Da, 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 da. And the Israelis say, if I give you back this river and you want to cut off the river, we'll die of thirst. Well, too big. So is there a higher law? What? So now I just give you a seminar in <laughs> the international law. 
of the Arab-Israeli <coughs> conflict. Now I want to tell you, it's very, very interesting because, um, let's go to the next one. This is why they can annex the Golan Heights. People think he did it because of an outburst of nationalism all directly. No, he did it for what I just said. He said, we, we cannot give it back. It's not because we're lost in the African territory. If it didn't have rivers and junk like that, maybe. You understand? Uh, maybe. After all, he gave back the sauna. But here you could pinch me off and cut up my water. You could cut up my water. So what's the point? Now, um, this is the reason, you know, don't laugh at this, this is the reason Trump recognized this. This is the official reason, okay? So when he, he said, you know, the goal on the This is the reason. It wasn't that he had a drunk day or something like that, you know? He, he said, this, only, you know, this is a special situation because you, you, it'll, it'll kill Israel, okay? Now, let's go to the next one. So far, the Biden administration, so far, has not withdrawn this recognition, which is very interesting, okay? You know, if you want to get, I wouldn't push it if I were Israel, but, uh, you know, because maybe they just forgot. <laughs> that's, that's the best, <laughs> you know? Well, you know, there's a passage in the Torah that God blessed man with a sense of forgetfulness. Sur Yolod Chateshi. So, you know, God blessed man with forgetfulness. But so far, they haven't pushed out. But I know one thing Biden is the best of them. Let's go to the next one. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. What would they do? Got to give it back. What about the water? Uh, too bad. Not too bad. The Israel goes out of business. That's all. It's too bad. Like that. Bam. So it's a crazy world we deal with. Now I'm going to take you back 30 years. That America just won the Saddam Hussein War, and now Baker and Bush are saying this: I want all the, the, the Israel, all the Arab states, at least the frontline states. You couldn't make Saddam Hussein, for example, come, or you know, well, Libya or something like that. But Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, the Arabian—that's a lot. Okay. So let's come to a peace conference. Uh, if Assad of Syria would attend the peace conference in Israel, that would really be something. Even though, really, his goal is what I just described to you, which is kind of a non-starter for Israel. But I must be wrong. I must be stupid because Rabin and uh, what's the other guy uh, after Sharon went to jail, you know, and uh, with Homer and these other guys. I mean, they all, you know, they're, they're willing to do it. You know, so I must be missing something. I don't know what, but I must be missing something. So if, if Assad, who was a sneaky goat, um, so let's put it this way, to get Assad to come, I remember this, so Bush and Baker really turned on the steam. Now, Assad was a super sneaky negotiator and a procrastor prevaricator par excellence. But Baker logged a million miles like a dog at process server, wearing down the opponent by what I call the Kinderman Schulstein tactics. So this is Baker and his lawyer best. They would go, the Israel did everybody, it's very smart. Assad said, I'm not going to talk to Israel, you got to get everything back. So tell me what you need for me to get you to agree to go to Israel. I need to make this and this thing, okay, we can make whatever demands you want. I need this and we can make whatever they want. You have to guarantee Israel, if I can't guarantee Israel, if I, but we can do it, it, it that way of talking. So a lawyer wants to get to do something, they'll say, come to do this, I want to do it. Tell me what I need to do to make you say yes. And see, and of course he did it to Israel as well. Like a good lawyer, Baker is a consummate professional, not allowing emotions to get in the way of diplomacy. Okay? Um, <laughs> uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. He <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Assad had this way. This is what they were like. Assad had this way. You come and he gives you a lot of coffee and tea, and then he talks to you for six hours straight. We're seven hours straight. And Baker just said, like this, he says, <laughs> I'm not going to give it. All right? So this is what it takes to negotiate in the Middle East. Now, I have my theories about Assad, but I'm all going to that. Now, um, anyway, so he worked very hard professionally. Well, he worked real hard in building up friendship with, with Shamir, by the way, like a good lawyer does. And he said to all of them, don't let a dead cat lie in your step. No, don't be, you know, this is Texas talking. You know, it'll be the... Um, you don't want to be the one responsible for the whole thing failing. Okay? In fact, 
Baker, as a lawyer, privately chastised Bush for being less professional, more petulant, and letting his personal feelings of resentment to Israel show. In other words, Bush, at one point, the APAC said we want to get the money anyway, and so on and so forth, and, uh, and Bush ends up criticizing Israel, he's like, I'm a little guy over here, and all the rest of it, and Baker's like, yes, that was stupid. He told him behind things, yeah. he said, that was stupid, you really messed up, using nice language. He said, you usually messed up. Um, you don't show emotion. You see? It doesn't help you, it actually hurts. This is a lawyer lawyer. He looks like a high priced lawyer. You get it? And, he, and look, let's go to the next one. Bush couldn't help himself. He was Bush. And I'll say it again, I don't think he's out to hurt Israel in his way, but he was crazy anything over the green line. And so when he had the Japanese uh, foreign minister there, he gave a whole speech to the thing. He said, my foreign policy in the United States, we do not believe there should be new settlements in West Bank or in East Jerusalem. I will conduct that policy as if it's firm, which it is. I will be shaped in whatever decisions we make, see whatever people comply with that policy. That's a strongly held view. Now, that's not articulate, because he was an inarticulate person. But you know what he's saying, right? You know what he's saying. So notice he was really harshly criticizing Israel. And at one point, as you know, well, this is a shame. Let's go to the next one. During the Gulf War in 1991, Saddam Hussein retaliated against coalition forces by firing Scud missiles at targets in Israel. Once again, the air raid sirens sent millions of Israelis scrambling for gas masks and sealed rooms. The U.S. asked the Israelis not to retaliate, and they agreed, holding their fire when 11 Scud missiles landed within Israel. In exchange, the Israelis asked for $3 billion to pay for the damage and $10 billion in loan guarantees to ease the burden of incoming Soviet Jews. Thousands of Jews from the Soviet Union are flooding into Israel this year. In 10 villages all over Israel, families wait for homes. The request for so much money surprised the White House. With an ask that large, the Bush administration felt like it had new leverage to pursue a peace deal between Israelis and Palestinians. What Israelis are more worried about is pressure from Washington to compromise with the Palestinians. Israel would get the money, but only if it went to the negotiation table to discuss Gaza and the West Bank. The Israelis are concerned that the U.S. is going to pressure them into making concessions. We will make our demands and they will make their demands, but we're not prepared to negotiate one thing. Our neck, our head, our heart, our existence. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir took a hard line with President Bush. Israel is attempting an end run around the president, appealing directly to Congress to back its request for $10 billion in loan guarantees. President Bush is demanding a delay and threatening a veto if he doesn't get it. More than a thousand lobbyists descended on Capitol Hill, pushing Congress to approve loan guarantees for Israel. But Bush held a hard line, too. Well, I was heard today there were something like a thousand lobbyists on the Hill working the other side of the question. We got one lonely little guy down here doing it. So, uh, so. Oh. Right. This is the famous like this little meat against all the Israeli lobbies. Now, I think he just blew some steam up, but he violated the Baker rule. You see? You don't let it show. Now, APAC and the company, I, we all remember this, were shocked by Bush's remarks. Because it sounded anti-Semitic. The Bush White House was shocked by the avalanche of anti-Semitic mail which had invaded the White House. This is the beginning of what we know now from the internet. You know, back once upon a time, as we know very well, it was a different country and there wasn't number one in the internet, number two, there were three TV channels. And, and you had that federal license to have the channel. And I think two more owned by Jews anyway. And so the bottom line is, you didn't see anti-Semitism on the TV, and you didn't see it in the movies. We, we take this for granted. And you didn't really see it on the radio because you, you use your license. And so even though there is a freedom of speech in this country, there's no freedom, that, no guarantee by the Constitution you get a license to run a TV show, or TV, uh, or, or radio, or anything else. Uh, there's no constitutional right that the, uh, the postman said, General House, deliver your mail. That's what they did to Father Cogba. You see? Hmm. So, um, in that time, you, if you were an American, you could fool yourself into thinking, it's a nice country, there's nobody anti-Semitic out there except for marginal group. But that simply means that those people were caught up from an opportunity to express themselves. As soon as the internet popped up, whoa! Okay? 
So this was an early one when Bush, who was not really anti-Semitic, but just laying on steam, got a million mail, and he himself was shocked. You know, get the damn Jews, and you did this right, and kill them all, and this kind of stuff. He's like, whoa, okay. Uh, this is not what Bush wanted. I remember he called it Shoshana Cardin and the APAC, and he said, and he said like this, he said, I never intended this, and then I want to live my life. You know, he, he felt bad about it, okay? Now, Baker, all this time, said, yes, I told you, none of this is helpful. Tell you the truth, Baker said, I regret my speech that I gave the APAC. That was stupid. I showed you the latest time, okay? We need to establish good relations with the Israelis and then leverage those good relations to push the Israelis to do what we want them to do. That's a sneaky lawyer. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something. Those guys get the big bucks. Okay? His client was the U.S. and he was pursuing the Bush policy and he was just pursuing very intelligently, you might say. Okay? On the other hand, Bush, being Bush, never did back down from his refusal as far as the loan grants are concerned. He only relented when Rabin became the Prime Minister. <laughs> okay, but the damage was done to Bush. Because, I'll say, especially now from a 30-year remove, I won't say his administration was anti-Israel, not really. <coughs> um, and there was much into the two-state solution, like, like, like uh, Clinton and all the others. But with these kind of body language things, he really sent like a very negative uh, message to Jewish people. And how much did he get when he ran for re-election? of the Jewish vote, 10%, right? 10%, which is like, you know, really low, which is kind of interesting, which is kind of interesting. Now, uh, to be honest, Isaac Shemir was stupid for announcing they were going to lose the Russians to the Shafin, right? It was also like, <laughs> like Sean Williams said, you know, you don't have to be stupid to be Jewish, but it helps. <laughs> and then, meanwhile, to bring in a million Russians, first of all, you don't have to move in there, and if you do, just keep your mouth shut. But no, he's got to go and make a whole big tarama of it. So and, he, and, you, and you know it's Bush. If it's Trump, it's one thing, it's Bush. So how can he be so stupid, you understand? So Bush kept the money frozen. On the other hand, Baker and Bush pushed for a peace conference, which would be the first peace conference ever, a conference which would have two tracks, A and B. First, one track involving peace treaties between Israel and the various Arab states, which is what Israel wanted. You had a treaty with Jordan, a treaty with Lebanon, a treaty with Syria, and all that kind of stuff. And second, the other track, was to work out some kind of two-state solution, or whatever you want to call it, with the Palestinians. Now, Shamir put a million obstacles. He's on the front of the PLO, because they're murderers. Baker, like I said before, like a lawyer finesse, okay, we won't get the PLO, we'll get Palestinians. He said, we can't be unofficial members of the... All right, so what if we get somebody who's not official member of the PLO, but he's a this. You know what I'm saying? That was always slice the difference. Because that's, I'll tell you again, that's what a good lawyer does. That's what a good lawyer does. And, you know, it got to the point where, you know, Israel couldn't say no to this guy, that guy, even though really, 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 they take the order as a matter of fact. Okay? But, you know, Baker said, I'm doing everything you're asking me to do. And so you can't say no. The point was to get this whole thing off the ground, and it did get off the ground. And so you had the Madrid conference, of 1991, late 1991, of course, and they were around the tables, you know, for the first time, you had Syria, and there was Shamir, and this one, and that one, all around the table. So Bush could say, and he was right, he said, listen, we, we, did, we, we, we did something uh, major. Uh, there's a lot of, let's put it this way, a lot of uh, PR stuff. Here, look at this. It's just, you know, from the AP. You know, a lot of PR stuff. Everybody got to see all the different countries coming. I was at this house a couple years ago. I don't know, was anybody here with me on the trip to Spain? Yeah, you were. So uh, you didn't get to go to the we didn't game, <laughs> right? But you got to see all the big mockers and the leaders of the country. They all paid, uh, you know, Sean Lake to the King of Spain at that time, Juan Carlos, and all the different mockers. And there's Gorbachev. You know, so, no, it was, it was a happening, no question about it. Okay? It's a happening. And there's Bush. And there's the king, and there's Gorbachev. And now you and I know Gorbachev was on the way out, like a month later he was a toast. You know? But nevertheless, nevertheless, it's, 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 it's a triumph of American diplomacy to get all these people around at an American-sponsored conference. What we seek is a Middle East where vast resources are no longer devoted to armaments. A Middle East where young people no longer have to dedicate and all too often give 
their lives to combat. A Middle East no longer victimized by fear and terror. A Middle East where normal men and women lead normal lives. The Jewish residents of Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, this is most important, believe that the most fitting response to Arab acts of terror against Jews is the creation of new communities. The greatest problem to overcome in the initial phase of the negotiating process, as far as I can see it, is overcoming mistrust and creating further solid foundations for meaningful negotiations in good faith. In Israel now, there are official parties represented in the cabinet who state publicly that Jordan is Palestine and that have designs on uh, violating the sovereignty of Jordan by transferring the Palestinians to Jordan and saying there you have a country. So in other words, it's obvious. They say you can make all the speeches you want. And I don't know where George Bush is living. I'd like to see the Middle East. You need more help for you to say, like, the Midwest. <laughs> the Middle East is not the Midwest. And he's even in pictures, right? But okay, he, you know, he said, we gotta start somewhere. No, poor Shamir, he didn't wanna be there. You gotta be there, you understand? And therefore, you just blah, 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 you make all the glittering generalities and look at this. ורק אנחנו כנראה התרגשנו כאשר בפעם השנייה נכנס יצחק שמיר לאולם הוועידה והעולם כולו יחד איתנו צפה בתמונות והמתין לנאום. We are ready to go to Jordan, to Lebanon, and to Syria for the same purpose. I am sure that there is no Arab mother who wants her son to die in battle, just as there is no Jewish mother who wants her son to die in war. I believe every mother wants her children to learn the art of living, not the science of war. Distinguished co chairman, ladies and gentlemen, let us resolve to leave this all with a united determination that from now on any differences we may have will be solved only by negotiations, goodwill, and mutual tolerance. Let us declare here and now an end to war, to belligerency, and to hostility. אני חושב שהנאום טוב, אני אהבתי את החלק ההיסטורי שלו. מבחינתי אפשר היה אותו לשאת גם לפני ארבע שנים. אבל כפתיחה, זו הייתה פתיחה. Let us march forward together to reconciliation and peace. יצחק שמיר סיים את הנאום, על הכרח בעולם במשבר, הנציגים הערביים לא מוחאים כפיים לשמיר. עכשיו הכל ממהרים להפסקה קצרה.
So what happened? Discussion groups form and lead the international capital, but they don't go anywhere because you can see it's all just, you know, public. The Palestinian thing is, is very thorny. Each side wants the other one dead. It's not that, it's, you know, the mother's dream of the mother's dream that the other one should die. In other words, nobody really wanted a two-state solution. Neither Arafat nor Shamir. Not really, okay? Each one wanted a one-state solution. Shamir would like the Arabs out, and Arafat wants the, the Jews out. But because the world is watching, the whole everybody goes through the motions, which may be a good thing, you know, if, if, if there's a process going, sometimes that puts the violence in a hole. This is how things live for a grand total of seven months. Because for the next seven months, the Likud is in power. The policy of Shamir is to stall. Okay? But in June of 1992, the Likud lost the elections. Not because the country disapproved of its hardline policy, but it was because they did a lousy job of Klita for the Soviet Union. The Russian Jews, I think they regret it today, but the Russian Jews voted against Shamir because they didn't like the fact that they felt they'd been treated like Sasha Bobs. That's, that's what it boiled down to. Okay? That's what it boiled down to. Now, that means that Shamir forgot one of the basic rules of politics, which is it's all about the economy. Remember uh, the beef? When I hear when I hear what when I hear when I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> so the Russian Jews, they said, I guess you know, Madrid, Baker, Shtachiv. Where's my house? Where's my job? Where's the beef? Okay, where's the beef? Remember, the, matter of fact, the same thing happened in the United States of America. What was Clinton's slogan? It's the economy, stupid, remember? So Shamir neglected that, because that's who he was. I mean, he was a foreign policy type uh, guy, and uh, that's how people vote. The result was, for the last time, well, no, not the last time, uh, the result was a radical change of policy, which is usually not what happens in elections. A radical change of policy from Likud to a two-state solution. Likud was anti two-state solution, and they voted now and brought in the majority of a labor which was pro two-state solution. This is in the middle of 92. Now comes God's sense of humor. <laughs> Bush and Baker lit the chops. This is Gavali. Now we're going to have an Israeli government that agrees with us. And now we're going to negotiate over here, and we're going to get finally what we want. Okay? But they never got to save her victory. This is where, as I say, divine comedy kicks in. By this time, June of 1992, and until Rob informed the government July of 92, George Bush was an electoral tsarist. Do you remember this? He was savaged by Pat Buchanan in the primaries. Do you remember this? Right? He did win the Republican primary, but Pat Buchanan cut him and sliced him. Okay? And then after that, barely bat battered and barely making it, he went on against Bill Clinton, who I think was the greatest politician of my lifetime. <laughs> I say I like him, but I'm talking about as a politician, there never was anybody like that. Okay? So Bush ran into Clinton. As a result, just at the moment of triumph, when he can savor the victory, Baker was basically fired. Now, not exactly. What happened was, if you recall, Bush said, I guess, I'm losing the election. you got to drop the State Department and take over the campaign, become my campaign manager. And so, hey, Baker would go, ugh, <laughs> you're, you're getting me 100 feet before the, the finish line. But he had no choice. Bush was his friend. And if you recall this, Baker had to resign the Secretary of State. He said, I'm taking a leave of absence. And had Bush won, he would go back in November. Okay? So, Baker dropped this. And therefore, July, August, September, October, he's spending full time, you know, uh, working to salvage an unsalvageable shit. Okay? If anybody's able to remember, they got Governor Schaefer to support Bush. Remember that? <laughs> uh, but it didn't help. Because I'll tell you again, Clinton was just formidable, you understand? And um, Baker is, of course, hoping to return after November and then follow up, finish up the two state solution. But to his infinite anguish, man proposes, but God disposes. Okay? And therefore, he had to leave that. I'll tell you right now, the Tsar, the Yogan, 
the Anochov, <laughs> my guy, Baker, who's saying, look, and the guy after him, you know, Clinton, those guys in their foreign policy, this and the other, is like, Ugh! you know? And a voice of heaven came down saying, you deserve it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this, as you see over here, you know, um, events follow some of the predictable line. Uh, obviously, next year, as you know, uh, Robin, and especially Paris, did make an Oslo Treaty. And they did make a kind of two-state solution. Not exactly the way the Arafat wanted it, but on the other hand, as you know, the leopard can't change the spots. Again, had they been smart, then they would have clamped down on all terrorism, the Arabs, and get area Z, B, D, G, E, F, G, you know. But as you will possibly recall, once they got a little bit, then they start blowing up the Dolphin area and whole waves of terrorism in Israel proper and alienated the Israeli left and certainly the Israeli center, which is funny. And when I talked about tonight, they went about very intelligently winning over the Israeli left and particularly the Israeli center. But then they screwed it up because at the end of the day, the leopard cannot change its spots. Anyway, that's uh, the Muslim Haskell that we get for tonight. And uh, with that, I bid you a good evening. Thank you.